Okay, let's uh, go to our Bible lesson for this evening. Tonight, this is intended for Catholics and non-Catholics. Because I want to take up a major subject or a major point, a doctrinal point of Roman Catholicism that those of us who are not Catholics strongly disagree with and uh, reject. But I want you to turn in your Bible to two places, Matthew chapter 16 and Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 16 and Matthew 18. Matthew chapter 16, and I'm going to start reading there at verse 13, if you'll follow along with me. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. I'll turn over to chapter 18, and I'll call your attention to one verse there, and that is verse 18. Matthew 18, verse 18, Christ speaking, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I call to your attention, or to call this to the attention of Catholics and non-Catholics this evening, because for us, the Bible is a very important thing. It's maybe the most important thing in the life of a believer. And I said recently, I believe that uh, most Roman Catholic people want to believe that their religion is also based on the Bible. I think they do. I think they want to believe that the things their church teaches, that its doctrines and practices and customs and traditions uh, are soundly rooted in the scriptures. I, I believe that. In these two texts, the words um, thee, thou, thy, and thine are singular references. Thou art Peter, in Matthew 16, verse 18. While the words ye, you, and your are plural references in Matthew 18. Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth. In these texts, especially chapter 16, verse 18, the Catholic Church believes that Christ called Peter the rock, or the foundation, on which his future church would be built. And he made him the preeminent bishop, or the very first pope, of his very small and fledgling, fledgling uh, body of believers. He gave the rest of the apostles similar authority in chapter 18 to bind and loose. And uh, so that's why today, over the centuries, it's developed into what we see as the papacy, the office of the Pope, and the College of Cardinals in a subordinate role to the Pope. Catholic writers and Catholic apologist defenders uh, claim that Peter was more in tune with the Holy Spirit at the moment Christ asked his question. And it was because he was more uh, sensitive to the revelation of God. He was able to say, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, and the others did not. 
as far as they can see it, Christ effectively said as much. Verse 17, Flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And as far as they can judge, it's a closed, uh, open and shut case. There's nothing more to see here. But thankfully, by the word of God, we can see a little farther, I believe, than they see when it comes to whether or not Simon Peter was made the first pope. If Simon Peter was the rock on which the church would be founded, then it's fair for us to ask a number of questions before we agree with him. If Peter was the rock, then question number one, why didn't Christ say it more than once? Or say it more clearly, so there wouldn't be any misunderstanding or ambiguity about it at all. In the Bible, there's a principle of two or three witnesses before any word is established, uh, before the, something, the truth of something is confirmed and established as a Bible doctrine or Bible teaching in the scriptures. To, um, it was a, given, first of all, to determine the guilt of someone accused of murder, New, Numbers 35, verse 30. Uh, that definition was repeated again in Deuteronomy 17, verse 6. Then it was expanded to include uh, someone accused of any crime in Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. It was invoked by Christ to settle some dispute with a brother. If thy brother offend thee, take with thee two other brothers, if he hear the church, and so forth. Matthew 18 and verse 16. It was recorded by John to establish Christ's credentials. In John chapter 8, verse 17, he said that Christ had three that testified of him. Uh, it was referred to by Paul preaching at Corinth three times in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 1. It was mentioned by Paul against believing one person's hearsay in 1 Timothy 5, verse 19. It was reiterated uh, as the means by which things were judged in the Old Testament by the Apostle Paul in the book of Hebrews 10, verse 28. You recall how Pharaoh's dream about the seven good years and the seven bad years, the uh, seven kind, uh, seven stalks of corn, that dream was repeated to him in the same night to confirm that this is what God was intending to do to Egypt. And we read that where two or three are gathered together in my name, Christ said, that constitutes a church. The Catholic Church then needs to offer to us and to the world two, or better yet, three scriptures, texts from the scripture in agreement with each other to confirm that Jesus indeed wanted Simon Peter to become the rock on which his church would be founded, the first bishop or pope of all the faithful. If Christ was making the pope, making Peter the pope. But the sad fact is they don't have two or three uh, scriptures to confirm each other. They don't really have the one. The text is still debated among Catholics and non-Catholics today, 2019, almost uh, 2020, here in the 21st century. So if Christ intended to make Simon Peter the first pope, he didn't exactly say so in that text we read a minute ago. When Peter was delivered from prison, he went to the house of John Mark in Acts chapter 12 who later wrote the Gospel of Mark. And uh, it's a pretty uh, good assumption that everything John Mark learned about the life of Christ, he learned from the lips of Simon Peter while he was in his home with the other believers there in the book of Acts. Um, but Mark's Gospel doesn't mention Peter being promoted by Christ over the others. Uh, either Peter was just uh, humble and didn't want to brag about himself, or he didn't say anything about it because it wasn't true. Nothing like that had ever been 
suggested or implied by Christ. And Peter knew it. It never did happen. That's question number one. Why didn't Christ say it more than once? If Peter was the rock, then question number two, why did the Lord Jesus address him as Satan merely five verses later? There in verse 23 of Matthew 16. Thou savest not the things which be of God, but the things which be of men. Now, even if we concede that Satan was working behind the scenes, behind Simon Peter, and it was Satan who Christ was addressing, who was working at work behind Simon Peter, it still isn't a very flattering way to address the one you just put in charge of your church. At the least, it's a very um, unfortunate arrangement of the verses, just five verses apart from each other, where he makes him the Pope and then calls him Satan a few verses later. Question number three, if Simon Peter was the rock, why did no one else in the New Testament ever seem to know about it? You don't get any indication that anyone else in the book of Acts or in the rest of the New Testament ever acknowledged Simon Peter as the authority of what believers are supposed to know, that he was the pri uh, primary teacher of the church, and it was his word that everyone was to submit to. There's no mention by anyone else that Peter was the chief bishop overall. Question number four. If Simon Peter was the rock, why did he seem to be unaware of it? I think I mentioned this on Sunday, but he worried about John the Apostle receiving something that maybe he wouldn't receive. He said, Lord, and what shall this man do in John chapter 21? And Christ said, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. That was a very uh, brief and direct response to Simon Peter that uh, he's to mind his own business and leave John's relationship with Christ uh, his own. Question number five. If Peter was the rock, the foundation of the church of Christianity, why did he need to be rebuked by the Apostle Paul, a traveling evangelist, for teaching heresy and not the other way around? Now, it wouldn't serve to establish the authority of Simon Peter and the office of the Bishop of Rome. It wouldn't serve to establish his authority to have the Apostle Paul uh, rebuke Simon Peter in Galatians chapter 2 playing favorites, you know, he's all koshery when he's with his fellow Jews, and then he uh, acts differently around the Gentiles. And the Apostle Paul said, you, this is, this is wrong in your part. You're a hypocrite. Um, but then, but then the, the Apostle Paul goes farther, and he writes about it in the book of Galatians. He writes about all this experience, and then spreads that around to other churches to read. That certainly was a that would certainly undermine Peter's claim to authority to have some traveling evangelist uh, spreading the fact that Peter had to be corrected. Question number six, if Simon Peter was the rock, why did he only write two modest epistles, first and second Peter, and yet the Apostle Paul wrote 14 books of the New Testament? Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews. 14 books of the New Testament by the Apostle Paul. Uh, Peter said that Paul's letters were, quote, Scripture, written according to the wisdom given unto him by the Lord, 2 Peter 3, verses 15 and 16. Question number seven. If Simon Peter was the rock, the foundation of the church, why did Christ say that his church would not be patterned after the hierarchical governments of the world? But the Catholic Church clearly is. The city of Vatican State, or the state of Vatican City, however the title goes, 
uh, is the, act the smallest actual country on Earth, only about 100 acres. They operate their own uh, law enforcement, they have their own bank, their own water system, their own utility and power system. They coin their own money. I think they have their own jail. And uh, they certainly, they send and receive uh, ambassadors all over the world. And they certainly don't shy away from meddling in governmental issues of other nations. It's a, uh, the Pope, as the um, visible head of the Roman Catholic Church, controls more wealth than any 10 billionaires you want to name combined. He has roughly one and a half billion members worldwide. If Simon Peter was the rock, the foundation of the church, question number eight, why did the focus in the book of Acts shift from Simon Peter and uh, Acts chapter 2 in the day of Pentecost to the apostle Paul and Acts chapter uh, 28 and the rest of the world? By the time you get to the end of the book of Acts, there's almost no mention of Simon Peter at all. And we assume he was still alive at that time. But the undisputed teacher of the New Testament church was not Simon Peter. It was the Apostle Paul. Question number nine. If Simon Peter was the rock, if Simon Peter was the foundation on which the church would be built, why did the Apostle Paul call Jesus Christ the rock? 1 Corinthians 10. And the only foundation, 1 Corinthians 3. And Peter himself called Christ the chief cornerstone, 1 Peter 2. How many rocks does the church of the Lord Jesus Christ need? In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, Moses said, For our rock is not as their rock. If the Lord God was the rock protecting Israel, um, and in type, the rock out of which water came when they were thirsty, if the Lord Jesus Christ, or rather if God was the rock, that guarded Israel, the one they were anchoring themselves to in faith, and Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh, then Jesus Christ is the rock on which his church is built. It's always perplexed me how Roman Catholic apologists and defenders can deny that Jesus himself is the rock and deny that Peter's confession of faith and his testimony of Christ is the rock. But it's Peter himself, the rock, that somehow the church would be founded upon. Seems to me a very, uh, recall back in Matthew chapter 7, earlier in the same book, Christ gave the story of the wise man who built his house upon a rock and the foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And the rains came and the floods descended and the wind beat upon that, and the one built on the rock fell not, but the one built on the sand uh, was ruined because it had no, no foundation underneath it. Well, what about the idea that Simon Peter proved himself worthy of that honor by Christ because he was in tune with the wording, or rather the will and the, the revelation of the Holy Ghost at that moment? And Christ said, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And Simon Peter spoke up. Maybe he proved himself more worthy of that honor than the others did, at least at that time. What about that? Did that qualify him to be made the future Pope? Go, if you will, forward to the book of Luke, chapter 2. And Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Every Catholic apologist will suggest that that indicated Peter was more in touch with the revelation of God and was uh, tuned into God's frequency 
and recognized Christ before anyone else did. This, therefore, qualified him for Christ's uh, promotion. But Luke chapter 2, and uh, notice verse, uh, verses 25 and 26. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Jump down to verse 29. After so, after he <clears throat> took up Christ in his arms, verse 29, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Well, maybe Simeon in the temple should have been made the first bishop, the first pope. He recognized that this babe holding, he was holding in his arms, this was God's Christ. This was the Messiah who would redeem the nation of Israel. And I might say, he was looking at a babe uh, in his mother's arms when they came into the temple, and he held that babe and prayed to the, the Lord about it. He didn't live to see that baby grow up and perform miracles or hear that baby preach or any such thing. So I, would, I could argue, or rather you and I could both argue, that maybe Simeon's faith was stronger than Peter's faith. He obviously recognized that this one was Christ. He was holding in his arms. Uh, 33 and a half years before, <laughs> before Simon Peter and the others recognized it. Go forward, if you will, to John, or rather Luke 4. Just go forward to Luke chapter 4. Luke 4. And notice there verse 41. And devils also came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. And he, rebuking them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. Well, Christ is casting out devils, unclean spirits out of people, and they came out and uh, uttering, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. And he tells them essentially to keep quiet, don't repeat this. The time's not ready yet. Some, now, maybe the devils could have been the first few popes. And I'm sure some might argue that they were, right? <laughs> or they still are. But they clearly recognized that Jesus was Christ, the Son of God. Go forward, if you will, to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Here's someone that is often overlooked. <clears throat> John chapter 1. Notice there verse... Oh, let's see. Verses 40 and 41. John 4... I mean, John 1, verses 40 and 41. And one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is, being interpreted, the Christ. Andrew recognized uh, Christ before Peter did, before Peter ever met the Lord Jesus. Maybe uh, Andrew should have been made the first pope. Maybe he should have been elevated to the preeminent bishop over the faithful. Go forward now to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, and notice the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, John chapter 4, she says in verse 25, it says the verse 25, the woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. So she was certainly looking for him to show up. And verse 29, she said, to her friends, come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? That was a positive statement. She was convinced of it. The Samaritan woman was persuaded. Uh, 
at that moment that she had met and just spoken to the Messiah, the Christ. Maybe she should have been made the Pope. Uh, they Why limit it to just men? Uh, God could have elevated her to be the first Pope. Uh, look also at John 4 and verse 42. After she runs back and tells her friends at, at home, they come out and they uh, encounter Jesus Christ themselves. In John 4 verse 42, And said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Well, the Samaritan town folks certainly knew uh, and recognized that this was the Christ. And maybe one of them should have lived and been made the first pope, the first bishop of the church. Go forward, if you will, to John 6. John chapter 6. Here, the Lord Jesus asked his apostles if they would forsake him. And uh, notice what Simon Peter says, verses 68 and 69. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Notice verse 69. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. All of the apostles recognized Christ for who he was. Now I want you to jump forward to John 7. John 7. John 7, notice one verse there. Verse uh, 41. Or verse 40 and 41. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. Verse 41. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Well, there are clearly some people there who had no doubt this must be the Christ. Who was it that revealed that this was the Christ to any of these? If not God, if not the Holy Spirit. Bystanders there who heard Christ speak and then recognized him. John 11. John 11. Notice there, Martha says in verse 27, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. That's almost the same confession Simon Peter made. And yet, all of these I just called your attention to uh, occurred before Simon Peter's confession in Matthew 16. All of these took place during the course of Christ's public ministry before he got down to just a short time before Calvary and Simon Peter said what he said. The idea of Peter being made the first pope is not based on Matthew chapter 16 verse 18, but it's only on the Roman Catholic Church's private interpretation of Matthew 16, 18, uh, which Peter himself warned against. Go to 2 Peter Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one. And notice what Peter writes in verse twenty, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Well, a Catholic apologist, uh, like Carl Keating, the way his mind works would be to say, well, see, this refers to prophecy. It doesn't refer to the declaration of who the Pope would be. Uh, and yet Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church, future tense. So in that sense, uh, Christ was indeed prophesying. Those words were prophetic. Uh, the church of Jesus Christ has to be built on Jesus Christ. Otherwise, it would be called the Church of Simon Peter. Peter said that's a sin not to be engaged in, to interpret some prophecy without taking other parts of the Bible into consideration. And I mentioned to you the rule of two or three witnesses before every word can be established. And I think that's an ironclad rule for fixing a doctrine in the Scripture. 
if someone proposes something they say is based on a verse of the Bible, say you need at least two or better yet three texts, clear texts from the Bible that all agree with each other before you can then run around and say that's a biblical idea, or that's a biblical doctrine. And uh, for anyone still watching, if you're a Roman Catholic, this wasn't meant to offend, this is meant to inform. But for us, the Word of God is preeminent. It's more important than anyone here, uh, than the opinions of anyone here, or anyone in our camp, or anyone of our fellowship, anyone in our church. Uh, the Word of God and the plain sense of the plain words of God are more important than anyone in our church, or any of our friends, or any of us, more important than me, and they have much more authority than anything I can say. I just lead you to the verses and put them all together like a jigsaw puzzle and see the picture that emerges, and the picture is that the confession of faith, thou art the Christ, the Son of a living God, uh, the faith in Jesus Christ, that's the rock on which the church is to be founded. Uh, in effect, Christ himself, 